name is Kat Oriel. I'm a reporter with Forbes Breaking News. Today I'm here with Representative Mark DeSaulnier of California. Congressman, thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Thanks for asking. Of course. So we're here today to talk about um, the passing of Senator Dianne Feinstein. The news broke this morning. She passed away at the age of 90. And I saw on a statement that you posted today, you called her a friend and thanked her for her um, partnership and expressed gratitude for her service. So. I want to hear from you. What was your friendship like with the senator? Do you have any fun stories or memories to share? Well, I, I have multiple ones, um, both as a constituent. I moved to San Francisco um, a long time ago when she was on the Board of Supervisors. Uh, I was a resident in the, in the restaurant business. Um, so starting there and then um, getting into politics in the Bay Area, about the time she got elected to the Senate. And she was very close friends with a close friend of mine, Alan Tauscher, who um, passed away five years ago, who was a member of Congress. They were very good personal friends. So that was my relationship with her um, in particular. And she was really uh, very available to me when I was in local government, when I was in the legislature in California and as a member of Congress. Um, so she became a friend, somebody I very much admired. Even though I didn't always agree with her, I was more liberal than she was. Did you ever work together to pass any legislation? You know, we've worked on multiple things. Um, I've spent a lot of my career in air quality transportation um, and education and labor issues, but water is a big issue, as you know, in California. Um, I've represented an area that um, the San Fr the Bay Area, California Delta is in. Um, so a lot of those issues we didn't always agree on, but we worked on those and on transportation issues. Uh, we did a, um, a request and a bill to look at infrastructure in the Bay Area and funding, um, particularly around access from the East Bay to the West Bay. I represent an East Bay district, and of course she was from San Francisco. So we tried to work on ways um, after Loma Prieta to make sure that um, transportation infrastructure was done in a more thoughtful regional way. Well, on a both personal and professional level, what was the most important lesson that you learned from her service? You know, she just had a grace and dignity to her that um, as I reflected on the floor today, Speaker Pelosi and the California delegation did a moment of silence, talked to colleagues who were mutual friends of uh, the senators. It's just striking given our dysfunction right now um, and the dysfunction of the Republican caucus. Senator Feinstein was a real ex example of grace, um, thoughtfulness, and tenacity across the aisle to get things accomplished. So it's something, unfortunately, uh, we've gotten away from where she really did believe in problem solving and respecting people who were colleagues, but represented a very different worldview and, and were voted to office from people who had different constituencies than San Francisco or the Bay Area, California. What do you think Senator Feinstein's lasting legacy will be? Is it her ability to reach across the aisle and work with people of the other party? I would hope so. I, I would hope that we go back to a model where accomplishment, grace, thoughtfulness would be um, it, like in her best moments, she was an example of. And now, unfortunately, uh, there are too many members here who are sort of the opposite of that. They are graceless, uh, thoughtless, and they want to get attention, not for the work they're doing, but for many of the things they're doing um, to prevent work from happening. And I, this is this is um, right now it's particularly true of a small faction of the Republican Party, but it's an approach to the work, I think, that I model a lot of my work on based on my relationship um, with Senator Feinstein. When it comes to working with people across the aisle, would you be willing to work with Speaker McCarthy to not avert a government shutdown, but end it at this point because it is inevitable? Yeah, I, I, I am a former liberal Republican back when they had those when I first ran for office and first met Senator Feinstein. Um, I've been a Democrat for 20 plus years. Um, so I have a reputation here as being very liberal, but working with people who are different um, and have different worldviews. I've been doing that uh, all this week. Um, but I, it's very difficult to renegotiate a deal that was already negotiated um, between the majority and the minority parties of both houses and the president. And then within two months, a small group of people 
who agreed to that and voted for that deal for the debt ceiling now want to renegotiate. And it's sort of rewarding bad behavior. And these are really political terrorists, in my view. They're not interested. I mean, how do you trust somebody, whether it's in business or in politics, if they consistently um, are untrustworthy? So I, personally, I think as a Democrat, uh, we have to stand firm. I didn't agree with the deal that was previously done, um, but that's the deal. So let's take the bipartisan resolution that Senator McConnell and Senator Schumer have successfully gotten out of the Senate. Let's vote for that. Uh, I think the my, my advice to Senator McCarthy or Speaker McCarthy is to bring that to the floor and see what happens. We know what will happen. It'll pass overwhelmingly with bipartisan support. And then we would avert this shutdown. And all that would give us would be 45 days to continue to negotiate. What is your biggest concern when it comes to the way it'll affect your constituents um, and people all across America? Well, the immediate concern is that our military won't get paid, our Border Patrol people won't get paid. The irony of that, because a lot of these folks who are holding up say they want to do something about the, what's happening on the border, which Democrats don't believe in open borders. We want to have a functioning border that um, meets the needs of the American public and workers and businesses but also is consistent with um, international laws and agreements we've signed on to in our own laws. And those Border Patrol people won't get paid, but they have to keep working. The military, as I said, um, childcare would go away for, they won't get paid, our contractors won't get paid. So the dysfunction and the ripple effect for your readers is really quite significant. I mean, I, if I'm a business owner, and I used to be, uh, I was in the restaurant business, um, this all ripples out. And your readers understand this, whether it's a big corporation or a small corporation like mine was uh, and my the restaurants I owned, they get affected. They're, they will be affected by this shutdown. And so what's the point of this? Uh, I would agree that there's a point where our deficit and our debt um, doesn't serve the purposes I believe in. So let's have a discussion about that and come to an agreement through the regular process. You know, people need to remember that these appropriations bill were approved by the Republican majority in the appropriations committees. Long hearings, a lot of work, a lot of analysis. And then these few people are saying, we didn't like that. We want to change it based on our worldview. You know, we've already seen this chaos play out with the debt ceiling fight, and now we're seeing it again. So what do you think that needs to happen so that this doesn't just, you know, it's kicking the can further down the road and the um, economy and government could find itself in another crisis? Well, we have to make this institution work the way it once did, um, where there's a process, we agree to it. Um, I'm the former vice chair of the rules committee in the house. Uh, I'm a process person and, we have to adhere to that. And over the course of the history of this country, we've had to adopt the, adapt those rules to the environment we live in. But this institution was meant an effective legislative body, having served on multiple ones from the local, the state, and the federal level, um, and had been on the executive board of the National Conference of State Legislators and looked at other uh, legis state legislatures. To get them to work, you have to empower individual members, but in a process that includes majority rule. Uh, and there's a way to do that. We're working on that um, so that we get out of this problem where we deal with more analysis than political emotion uh, that isn't based in any kind of real problem solving. So that's a long sort of wonky response to your question. There are rules that need to be adhered to. Um, and those rules are majority rule, go through the committee process, go to the floor and work through it. One of the things we need to do is I think change the Hassock rule where it won't come to the floor unless there's a majority of Republicans voting for it. In this instance, um, five people can hold up it coming to the floor because the speaker allows them to do that. So that should change. And that should change as a bipartisan conclusion of this, having a majority of the governing majority party, then it has to go to the floor. And then there's an up or down vote. If we had that, uh, or a rule where something sent over on a majority basis or a supermajority basis from the Senate has to come to the floor within a specific period of time, we would be out of this crisis. Um, and we wouldn't, and it would solve the problem you said, where we're not, you know, if you keep doing what you've always done, you get what you've always got. And that's what we have right now. So we have to deal with the immediate crisis and change the rules that allow this to happen.
I do want to go back a little bit, but still in the spirit of looking toward the future, as we look at the passing of Senator Feinstein and what it means for California politics and national politics, Governor Gavin Newsom said that he would appoint a black woman to serve um, in her seat. Um, and Representative Barbara Lee, who's running for the Senate, has said and argued against the notion of a caretaker you know, being put um, into her seat, and it's insulting to the people who want effective long-term representation for African Americans in California. So I would like to know what is your perspective on the situation, and who would you like to see Governor Newsom place in that seat? Well, I th uh, Congresswoman Lee is a very dear friend. Her her district is right next to mine. Uh, we work very, I have enormous respect. Uh, just another, like Senator Feinstein, uh, a real trailblazer in the standard of California and California women, along with Nancy Pelosi and others. Um, Adam Schiff is a dear friend as well. Katie Porter, I serve with on the oversight committee. Um, it, the rules say it's up to the governor. Uh, he did make that comment. Um, that was then, this is now. Uh, I don't have a preferred um, approach and I wouldn't, if, if I was asked by the governor, uh, I would give my advice, but I, I think he needs to be thoughtful. He's gone through this before, of course, um, when uh, then Senator Harris uh, became vice president. And then he appointed Alex Padilla, a very dear friend and colleague from the legislature now. So we had a lot of talented people. Um, with a lot of different background. Um, so I would support somebody who was in the model of Senator Feinstein in terms of her thoughtfulness. Uh, and then I think we do have to be mindful of the changing um, responsibility to have a diverse representative um, group from California and the state of California. There are a lot of talented people um, and they represent many different perspectives. Barbara, one of them, Adam, one of them, Katie, of course, one of them. So I don't have a preferred person. I've really been focused for a long time on respect for Senator Feinstein. And I was critical of people who asked for her um, resignation. We as voters knew how old Senator Feinstein was. We should have known, and many of us did obviously know that it was a six year term and her health conditions. So I've been more focused on that. Do you have anything else that you would like to add when it comes to Senator Feinstein's legacy or the other topics that we discussed today, like the shutdown? No, I, I, th I think the way out of this for this country is to um, model our behavior more based on role models like Diane Feinstein, who was tenacious, thoughtful, and always acted with dignity. Thank you so much for your time today, Congressman. Thank you.